downhill from there. All right. <clears throat> so, Invincible. Uh, I'm sorry also. I, I, you know, we're going to jump in here and talk about this stuff. Uh, I don't know. I'm not really going to use any of the before stuff. So, to start us off, uh, Nerd Psycho Comic Flick Show, here we go. We're going to talk about Invincible. Invincible on Amazon Prime. This is your Nerd Psycho Comic Flick Show for June 7th, 2021. I am SC Hitch, and because T Mitch, our showrunner over on our Star Wars show, started doing it, I'm going to do it too, where I actually introduce the cast members on our show over here. Oh, before, like a comic before, book show. before you do that, name? you got to. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Roberts. All right, so this will be a good way to introduce everybody. Yeah, there All we right. go. Yeah, yeah, there you go. There so you go. So, on base. Uh, yeah, I grouped him. Uh, this, this is a way more of a PDS than it should be. All right. So, there we go. No, I did it again. No, that's again. Yep. <laughs> there on. we go. All right. So <laughs> there it is. I didn't even notice. That tells you that a poor producer I am. Uh, so this is Nerd Psycho Comic Flick Show. It's a show where we talk about uh, you know comic mediums and the shows that we like in comics. Today we're going to talk about Invincible, and uh, you know, real excited to get into it. I know we missed last time. My fault, guys. Had a had a personal thing. Very very sorry. We had an awesome guest lined up too. Super bummed we had to cancel. And now my schedule's a little up in the air for personal reasons, so I didn't feel comfortable rescheduling yet. But we're going to have him on soon. We'll announce all that as we move forward. Um, I want to thank thank uh, thank him for the patience on that. So until they, in case it doesn't materialize, I won't say their name, so it won't be like they canceled because I was rude. <clears throat> all right. So getting into it, uh, I want to introduce the cast at NCFS before we move on. Uh, this is my partner in crime. A man who charged me $10 for his debut album, D.P. Brown. <laughs> I'm the man that... Sucks the money out of you. <laughs> he did not That's what I do. I didn't deserve it. Uh, and, and below our uh, our resident uh, comic fan uh, slash uh, man of. And he has a second job. That's right, two jobs. Two jobs. <laughs> that is Michael. Michael, welcome again. That's all to the show. Uh, all right. So before we get into the meat, and this is a very meaty show. <laughs> We've been watching. There's a lot of meat. Uh, oh yeah, a lot of meat all over of, the place. A lot of people turn Flatters, into meat here. You know, uh, <laughs> DP Brown, do everybody a favor. Tell them where they can find us and the rest of our content, please. NerdCyclopedia.com, people. You will see our links on our all our favorite platforms uh, at NerdCyclopedia on Twitter, Facebook, and also on Instagram. Make sure that you are visiting our website uh, where you can actually leave some feedback for us. Nerds at NerdCyclopedia.com as well. Um, visit our Facebook um, um, group because we have like you know a couple groups out there, Nerd Cyclopedia and a Carbonite Bonnie BS, the Star Wars podcast, um, Star Wars group, which we also have a podcast for. It. So make sure that you are listening to the Star Wars Carbonite Bonnie BS um, podcast. <laughs> there we go. Um, also, um, make sure that you, if you are watching us on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, uh, any and also the notification button. So anytime that we're on, you know that we're on. Um, listening to us on like on your um, phone or podcast, we are on Stitcher, we are on iHeartRadio, we are on TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Guess what? We are there. All right, thank you so much, DP. All right, so this is this Invincible is, you know, it's maybe one of the, you know, one of the most crazy violent things I've ever seen in my entire life, and 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 in that way. It is very much a Robert, you know, a Robert Kirkman joint, right? It is very much like The Walking Dead in the way that it's visceral. Uh, in this set, you know, we sort of get the remainder of the plot. And we, and we kind of talked about the characterization of Nolan. Um, and uh, and we talked about all the sort of the characters last time. So let's dive right into what happens and kind of, kind of move through this. So let's talk about sort of the first. There's two little arcs here that kind of, that we kind of get, right? We get the finale arc. Mm -hmm. And we also get an arc where, you know, the kids go to college and they see what's going on <laughs> in comic book college. That's uh, that classic Spider-Man, um, you know, go to college, superhero go to college and tries to hide, try to hide his identity type thing. Okay. Right. So, so DP, what is your favorite way that they, they messed with that trope in Invincible? What was your, what was your favorite thing they did up there that made you like, <laughs> like go that, you know, this is something they're, they're, sort of lampooning well they, they yeah they mess with it um you know like i said peter parker goes to the school and has to hide his identity with um with i'm trying to remember exactly how you know it was 
a particular scenario that would be okay that's a different way of actually handling it um his girlfriend was on the scene and um she she before she found and we find out later on that she already knows that he's invincible yeah you know she been new you know so that was a good way to subvert like the trope of okay you know you're trying to hide the the identity from the girl and you know from his girlfriend and everything and she just finds out in like such a crazy fashion and everything so yeah we find out a little later um after you know he goes through all this rigmarole trying to hide his identity you know from the you know doing the fight and everything and then come back later to say okay he was over at this place you know his girlfriend knew pretty much where well, who he was but was sort of like playing along in, in a in a way but um but still getting mad at him because all of a sudden he just like disappeared <laughs> you know mm-hmm. so um I, I like the way they subverted that that trope right there awesome awesome and michael what what do you think about this this setup where you know you have like this secret lab thing going on in a in a college like what what do you think about like how they're how they're portraying like the way the comic book universe treats higher education I mean, it just goes, you, you have to have more villains than just the main villain. You got to introduce more characters. So him traveling, of course, is going to introduce more characters. And so, I mean, I guess the one thing is they recognize the evil genius of, mm-hmm. of the guy. And, uh, you know, so they bring him back, make him a reoccurring character again. Yeah. <laughs> um, also played yeah. by Ezra Miller, you know. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so it's just like, it's it's just a way of introducing more characters into the scene because you just can't just be still made of bringing the same character over and over. I mean, you, you have eight episodes to field and you have, you know, you're, you're building up more seasons and everything. So it, it, it's just a good way to introduce more characters and like, Oh, this guy can build these indestructible robots. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe we need this guy around. So yeah. we, we can, just, we can just tame him from killing people and integrating humans into cyborgs. <laughs> If we could only keep him from committing the murders, it would really work out. Yeah. I like that they, I like that they, every time like Cecil sees him, he's like this freak right here. You know what I mean? Like they don't pull punches about like the fact that it's disgusting that he's like, that they have to keep him around. You know what I mean? I, I really enjoyed that. I, I also like that they, that they had, uh, they had Justin Roiland played that uh, douchey guy from the beginning of this episode. So he was playing that guy that got the first victim, right? What was his name? God, I can't remember. Justin Roiland. Where, where, where is he from? Rick and Morty. Ah, Both okay, Rick and all right. Morty, which yeah. made it funny. To oh me, wow! <laughs> which made it funny to me that yeah. they had a character named Rick that Justin did not play. That made it. That was very awesome, in my opinion. Uh, <laughs> it's just a super duper cool thing. I like that they gave they gave Mark's friend like the love story here, and that they made it sort yeah. of kind of sweet, but they didn't let it end right because of this this weird comic book spin that their world is stuck in, right? It's all there's nothing they can really do about it because this you know Rick's been kidnapped by a man who needs corpses to reanimate because he can turn them into indestructible robots, and where else are you gonna get a corpse except some dude? Uh, so how about the the trope where you know his, his best friend finds out his identity and everything, and you know he goes through all like the um the identity um okay well are you gonna come save me <laughs> you know type of thing okay I'm stuck here so you know I'm calling you um um. You know, I'm calling you and everything. And, you know, he's not available because he's at like a party or whatever. You know, so it, it was it was really interesting. They 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 played around with some 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 thugs, You know, some things. You know, some tropes there to make it a little different as far as his whole secret identity thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was a good episode that they brought out, and you know, just to differentiate from everything else, what was going on. So it was a good episode of just changing the mix and changing everything around. Yeah, introducing new characters. Having characters build from one another, you know, you know, getting, you know, getting Mark's a girlfriend, and you know, getting the understanding of, I know who you are. Now your best friend knows who you are as well too. So it, it's just, you know, just integrating more to the story. Absolutely, I like this arc a lot. It reminds me of the old, um, <clears throat> a little bit of the old Spider-Man cartoon from the '90s. You know what I mean? A little bit uh, of that sort yeah, of type of Peter Parker. Series, yeah. yeah, a little bit of that sort of Peter Parker. But you know, the thing about this series that it's consequences, right? There's consequences, consequences, consequences. So Rick doesn't come back. This guy doesn't come back. You know, the, you know, everything doesn't reset to normal. Like, uh, you know, Mark's relationship with Amber is damaged by, like, it actually is damaged. There are, are real yeah. things that happen as a result of this sort of mirthful, 
you know, mirthful trip to college that should be a fun thing. It isn't. It's just terrible, terrible nightmare because everything's a terrible nightmare in this world, right? It all is. They need superheroes everywhere. All right. All right. So <clears throat> let's let's move back just a little bit because I, I know we sort of, you know, we jumped. I, I like that part. So I wanted to jump ahead a little bit. And I want to talk now about, yeah. um, you know, about how Cecil and Dark Blood are dancing around the fact that they know that Nolan committed the murders of the Guardians of the Globe. Um, guys, what did you think about this characterization of, you know, uh, well, Walden Goggins is playing Cecil, so obviously that characterization ruled. Yeah. Because <laughs> it always, <laughs> he, do, he always delivers, you know what I mean? Uh, but, uh, Michael, what did you think about this this plot with, uh, you know, what was what were your thoughts about this investigation that's moving forward? We find out what people know. Well, I mean, at that point in time, I also I, it goes back to feeling bad for the wife. You know, I mean, because the wife finds out, you know, from um, you know, finding finding the notebook, finding his bloody his bloody suit, getting it, um, you know, analyzed, and you know, you got you got to feel for the wife who has been lied to her entire life, thinking this guy is you know yeah. the almighty hero, and, you know, and, and they have this great family. And everything, and then and dark blood tips her off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, yeah, and then he finds his his notebook and the suit, and you know, so you, you got to start feeling bad for the wife at the point in time because she she's just you know this human, and it goes back to you know when when she's scolding Mark, you know, when back in the backyard when Mark, you know, what are you going to do about it? You know, back when you were saying last week when it's like, you know, I can't physically do anything, you know. So mm -hmm. so, but then the you know the the underlining of um you know having Cecil try to find out what's going on with everything. It's just, uh, I, I like how like they did it. They didn't do it went on the open. I, I just find it always amazing that, you know, the invisible people always show up. <laughs> like how do <laughs> yeah, these people at all the time? I mean, like there's like 30 of them in the house. How do you yeah. not trip over one of these guys? They're good. They're That's all just how good around. they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The, um, Michael brought up a point. I, I did like that scene between Mark and his mom about um, when when they when he was going back. He was really mad at his mom, and they were going back and forth. And um, it, it was a typical teenager type thing where you know the teenager is getting all you know they they're feeling themselves and coming to their parent like I'm I'm actually more powerful than you. I could do anything to you, you know. And the mom was just like, well, you can't. You know, for the most part, I mean, and I can't do anything about it, but I'm still your mom, mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day. So mm. physically, you know, he can crush her mom, you know, his, his mom and everything. You know, he can physically do things that she wouldn't be able to, um, you know, be able to, um, to, to go up against and everything. All she really has is that mind, not mind control, but that, that I guess that that love to, to let him know this is the, I'm still your mom. I still love you. Yeah. But, you know, while I can't do anything about you hurting me mm -hmm. physically or whatever, you know, I still have that. I, I'm still your mom. So you still got to think about that. I'm, 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 you're, you're, you're still a part of me. Whereas your dad, you know, is, is, well, she didn't get into that conversation, but, um, but, you know, I, I just, I just like that, that, that moment that those two had and for her to reiterate that, you know, she was his mom. Uh, was a very great relatable teenage moment where a teenager just feels himself, you know, so much that they go up against their their they finally have the 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 balls to go up against their their parents, and um, you know, sometimes the the teenager is stronger, sometimes not, you know, <laughs> but um, but, who, but yeah, it was and, a great and, moment between those two. And what's great about this microcosm, and and it's interesting because it gets down to this. Kind of in the finale, it gets down to this. It's, it's what is the moral, you know, authority of the parent-child relationship, right? What is the morality of that? And and I think that what's neat about the scene you're referencing from, from I think, episode two is that every man effectively, almost universally, gets to a point where they become physically stronger than at least one of their parents, right? You get there. You do. Because, I mean, I, I'm, yeah. you know, it, it's a physical thing. And so this conversation that that Mark has with his mother is one that could happen to anybody. This doesn't have to be a superhero right. conversation. And that's what's so brilliant right. about it, because he means I can just fly wherever I want in the universe. But he could just mean <clears throat> I'm stronger than you now. And yeah. and that's one of the things that pins, 
you know, the emotional heart of this story together is the fact that, you know, Mark is is committed to the human half of him as as much as he is, you know, the, the Vilt, Viltrum, Vilt, what is it, Viltrum, 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 the Viltrum might have. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and and that that connection is so important for how this is resolved. It really is. Right. So going back but to like the, the whole also, aspect of it, mm-hmm. Cecil kind of like is the like I would say a good version of like a Lex Luthor, you know, like how do you stop the most unstoppable man, you know? So he, he so he can't give away his his motive on what he's doing. So I mean, that's why he takes the doctor from the college because he finds out you know these cyborgs. That's why he tries to keep bringing back the immortal <laughs> for being immortal. Oh, sure yeah. dies a lot at this show. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. You know, it just, just it just has to find a simple you know find out how how do you stop an unstoppable force basically so I mean yeah. I mean his crazy idea is to send his son after him right you know everything yeah. let's let's sign out this big monster you know that you know it's just going to delay the inevitable and his and his son Mark you know he's he's basically going through puberty you know he's going through his you know adolescence and stuff and you know going through like you know his teenage years having doubts, trying to figure out himself. In the meantime, you know, um, Cecil is, is slowly but surely, you know, trying to mold him into something, you know. So that's where we, you know, where we get that. And I, I love the way, it, the, the, like we talk about his mom, his mom is filling out the, her character by um, not being scared of Mark, but actually, you know, um, just, just sort of like standing up in, in a type of way, you know. And later we, we see her, um, you know, go with Cecil and everything. Um, and she starts to get everything confirmed, you know, as far as the, 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 um, her husband is concerned. I think that that scene of her being like that, that revelation, right? That the reason I didn't tell you, you know, what was going to happen is basically because by the time it really did, I probably was like, it seems like he, you know, for the most part, things go normal he's going to let her live out her natural life. You know, it doesn't really matter to him if it's another 50 or 60 years. What's he say when he yeah, starts what's killing that, people? Yeah, what's just a speck of dust? <laughs> what's the difference between now and 50 years from old age? What's the difference, right? Mm-hmm. His lifespan's very different. It's like, you know, you don't... There's certain facts about the universe I wouldn't explain to my Dalmatian either, right? And is that, <laughs> is that you know, arrogant well, speaking, of me? Speak, well, speaking of which, you know, he did refer to his wife as like a pet. Yeah. You know, yeah. a, a loving pet, you know, which is, you know, um, <laughs> it's, it's really interesting. And, and I mean, well, some people love their pets, you know, it, I, I guess the way the context he referenced it in is that, you know, if you, you, you know, some people love their pets as they would or like a regular human being, sometimes even more, you know, so you could take it as that, okay, well, he loves, he, he loves his pet, re, you know, really um, a, a lot. But in the context that he was representing, in his lifespan mm-hmm. and uh, um, how he treats just individuals and everything, to, to love his wife as he would just a pet is something of what I, I gather was sort of ink, uh, insignificant to him, you know, in the, in, the, in, the long, in the long scheme of things. But we even get like a, um, a flashback of when they went to like a baseball game when Mark was a kid. Yeah. And... Um, he sort of he was standoffish and not really caring about um, you know what Mark was going on like what what does this really mean mm-hmm. and then something happened and then you know he sort of just felt something I think that was like uh, the second to last episode something like that I think it was, the, was, last, no, it was the last episode yeah that was the flash he had it was, it was last this episode? yeah that was yeah. when he was smashing him against the mountain and look here's the here's the oh, other okay. thing about this climax and how it relates to to the conversation that. Uh, you know, uh, that Mark had with his mom in the backyard is that what he is insisting that uh, Nolan feels for him is, well, basically that same respect. You won't do this because I'm your son, right? You won't kill me and you won't destroy the earth because I'm your son. And it doesn't, nothing else really matters because that's all that matters, right? right? And that's what he, that's, that is essentially the point that he makes to Nolan at the end of why Nolan basically probably leaves is because. He can't do it. And so since he can't do it the whole way, he won't do it at all. Because you, you can't, you know, you wouldn't want to, you wouldn't destroy the whole earth. You just wouldn't do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So so the, the time that he spends 
and trying to show show Mark. I mean, I guess we're talking about the finale now. So yeah. the time that he spends trying to show Mark how insignificant humans are, you know, to him, you know, um, he could he didn't he did, if he if Nolan really didn't care about um, Mark, he wouldn't waste time trying to show him all these things. Mm-hmm. You know, he would just get right to the point and just destroy him. He and essentially he wouldn't have wasted all his time on this on the earth. Because he, I think if I gather from from the story and everything, he spent a long amount of time on Earth, probably longer than what he should have, you know, um, um, to come he to the point what, where 500 he got five hundred years to do with Earth, whatever he wanted with Earth, right? Yeah. It's like the he said the, that's the closest we get to a vacation. <laughs> it is the planet's yours for five hundred years, right? So he has plenty of time. But what accelerate? What is it about Mark's Mark that accelerates his process, right? So he knows now that basically. As long as he leaves Earth in a position where Mark's, where Mark's the strongest thing on Earth, that everything will pretty much work out no matter what, right? As long as nothing can rise to destroy his son, then his, pro- you know what I mean? It's still his planet, effectively, if his son's running it. Right. At least that's how I feel about it anyway, were I a uh, conqueror of this sort. And I'm not, thank goodness, for you're all <laughs> very glad that I don't have superpowers. Yeah, I like the way they um they, they give us a little bit of reasoning as to why, um, you know, Nolan is trying to, well, they're, they're, the Viltrumites are who they are, mm-hmm. and they're they're essentially just trying to conquer the <laughs> conquer planets and stuff. Yeah. You know, so the revelation of um, of why Nolan is who he is was a bit of an um, interesting thing, you know, within the context of the show. And for him to, um, it, it, that, that whole final two episodes was just a, just a complete, just, whoo, Especially the final episode was just a complete shock, you right. know. But yeah, I mean, you see, you see, Nolan just grab that that piece of humanity, that one little shred of humanity that we have that separates us from the animals, man. Mm-hmm. You know, so you know, and that's it, it, it's just like just for that second when he flashed back to you know the baseball scene and everything. It's just he it, it just gets that glimpse of humanity and you know, and sees the good in Mark and everybody, so he can't can't bring himself to do it. It's almost yeah. like he can't help, but because he he he's been on that earth for so long that humanity that part of human that human part of him, he just it, it just it's almost like he couldn't help but have it in himself, you know. And mm-hmm. he's ends up using that human part to raise Mark, which is really that love mm-hmm. that he's that he's he was reluctant to give, but found himself just slowly but surely, you know. Um, I be I I I want to use the term indoctrinate, but that's that's not the right term, you know. But it, it, slowly, but you know, surely being infused with the whole family type of dynamic. I mean, if you're if you're around people long enough, you can't help but feel a part of them when when something adverse happens, you know. So to to say that Nolan is just outright, you know, um, just a outright villain, which he you know is, you know. <laughs> Um, but he still has that that human that that human love for his son, you know, and to his you know wife to a degree because he could have did anything to her. Um, yeah. We we but, we, we but see then that. Then you, you also see the the inhumanity that he has <sighs> when he uses Mark as a ram to kill oh, yeah. hundreds of people in a subway. Oh, when I saw that scene, I texted you guys and said, yeah. this subway scene is one of the most unbelievable things I've yeah, ever seen. Yeah, and he yeah. just holds them up. Like, I didn't think they were actually going to do it, and they just they just went for it. And it was just, just unbelievable. Just so use the his face like a cheese grater. Just... Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, that's... That, that, that's, that's worse than any Zack Snyder film. And, you know, <laughs> Metropolis coming down. You know, that's... <laughs> his, yeah, I, his I... scene in Chicago is mm-hmm. just... Yeah, I couldn't. Everything. I couldn't really imagine that scene in a movie live action without it being like just hard rated R, you know. Um, but that was that was awful. That was yeah. awful. It's the medium of animation and what it brings to the the table and what it offers to superhero. Right. You have a lot comics. more. You have a lot less limitations. Yeah, <laughs> and you can be a lot more exaggerated too, right? Omni Man can literally punch through some. Yeah, you know what I mean. He can punch someone's head off, and it's just like wow. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not. It's totally, totally different than, like you said, it would just get so much attention if it was in, in real life. Like the boys gets all that attention for the gore there, but I don't I was know just that this is. That. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That this is much worse. Like this is. I mean, I guess head, head explosions are pretty common in both, huh? 
Hmm. <laughs> yeah, the, the 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 boys, I don't think is sort of. I mean, it's played for laughs in a, in a way, or it says a satire. This is not satire. Mm-mm. No, it isn't. It is not satire. <laughs> that's true. It's definitely it's definitely like like no like if in, if in the boys like all the consequences like all the chickens always came home to roost, right? Like yeah. in this show. If you if it's like oh no something bad is gonna happen it happens every single time like, yeah. oh I hope nothing right. happens to this you know the to you know the new boyfriend it happens right like that all that they like they train you on this show to anticipate real jeopardy all the time and to anticipate that even if everything seems normal or another form of jeopardy you can't anticipate is gonna pop up and so it may I remember watching this and, and being unsettled as we rounded the turn on like episode into episode seven. When I was like, oh, there's only two episodes left and there's just so many things up in the air. Yeah. Uh, and, and I just think that they did a really great job, you know, giving this show a heart to it that made this decision by Omni-Man to, because essentially it's that he can't hurt his kid, right? That's the thing he can't do. Because he, yeah. could, he could not kill the kid and just destroy Earth, but it would hurt the kid. And so what he remembers at this baseball game is this vicarious realization that his success was the, was his son's success, and his right. happiness was his son's happiness, and so he couldn't do it because not not just because of the the Viltrumite thing, right? Not just because of the genetic superiority philosophy, but because of some empathetic, right? Because <laughs> of the empathetic relationship he has. With the the humanity of it all. The humanity. There's humanity. Oh, there's humanity in this man. This from Viltrim. <laughs> yeah, Nolan. Nolan. Um, no, I, I I see Nolan having a um to reconcile himself with being a Viltrumite. You know, Viltrumite and um question. It's it's like being you 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 were born one way and you're so ingrained with that with your with the way you grew up the way that you were taught the way that you know you were brought up and you know you know nothing else but that and you were sent on a mission to do something and you you didn't question it whatsoever. Now these certain things that feelings that you never can even consider you're now having questions. So you you start questioning one thing and you start questioning many things and then. You know, I just see that. Um, I, I, I don't see, I don't see a redemption arc for for Nolan, but I see it heading in a direction where Nolan, um, is probably going to end up teaming up with his son, <laughs> or you know, well, his I, I son, mean, he's going to have so to make the sacrifice. That are left yeah. open for the for the next season. I mean, I so you. many stories. I mean, you got you got you know the little things from you know Titan taking over to you know the oh, yeah, immortal yeah. coming back. Yeah, you know, yeah. and, and two. I mean, I sure hope we see more Battle Beast. We have to see oh, more please. Battle Beast. More, but this is Michael Dorn. Michael Dorn plays Battle Beast. I mean, please that is more just, Battle Beast. <laughs> I I want to know, like, I want to know so much about, like, who would win between between Nolan and Battle Beast. Like, that's all I want to see now. Yeah, is just they I want to see it happen. They have to match up. They have to match up. <laughs> I want to see it happen. But it almost seemed like Battle Beast sort of smelled Nolan, and then it was like, uh, <laughs> like, whoop. <laughs> out of here. Oh yeah, I can't win. Uh, it would be no honor to fight this fight. <laughs> yeah, that, that that would be an awesome thing to see. How about that one scene where we didn't really? It was a, I think it was a big scene, but we didn't really get much from it. From when they went to the um, when Cecil took, was it Cecil who took um, his wife, or was it um, Mark into that room, and uh, he turned the lights on or off or something, and it was oh, all yeah. white. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was Mark. Yeah, yeah, he's like, yeah, this, that was, was this it Mark? room that okay. uses only light, it's invisible to the human eye. Yeah, what kind of crazy stuff is that? Because he said one thing that was really key, because we've been putting water, we've been putting in something in the water for so many years to where, you know, in, in the water for people, you know, to drink and everything, and yeah. then that, what, what the, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, here, here, I feel like this is sort of like an indictment of what a con of conspiracy theorists in our world, right? Yes, because like, yes, because like yes, these guys, yes. they say these crazy things, and it's like, well, if that were true, what would like how powerful would the entity that's doing that thing have to be to be uh -huh. able to exert that degree of control? And the answer is about as powerful as the GDA. They can teleport. They have an unlimited number of totally invisible troops that they can keep invisible. <laughs> they have, you know. They have all these resources, and that's about that's about it, you know, for them to, you know, for some shadow shadowy cabal.
to run the world. They'd have to be right. about that but for, good. But for the organizations that they run, they are still no Omni Man. Cannot destroy Omni Man. That's true, and they try so hard. <laughs> but you know, yeah. with, the, with the kaiju, they try. They even take Mark's DNA after this fight with uh, Titan, and this is and that's a great episode too. I felt like of any of these episodes reminded me of Batman the Animated Series, uh, which of course is my favorite superhero cartoon. Uh, this is the episode that did that, right? With Titan, this team up episode with a crime boss. And then they're, you know, there's, does he yeah, have the a hard boss is black mask. We all know it's black mask. Oh my Come God. On. And, and, and the P the guys playing this. So like it's Dodd from season two of Fargo is the guy who plays uh, machine head. Like Chris, Chris oh. Diamatopoulos who played Mo in the three studios and was the, uh, the, the creepy sound operator in the office. He's in a bunch of other okay. stuff too. Uh, <laughs> plays um, Isotope, right? So they have like every single every single role is filled by somebody like really good. The guy from Burn Notice is all, that's Burn Notice. He's also in Burn Notice. Okay. That's, oh yeah, we, we we talked about all the, the unsuspecting people who are playing this show, this yeah. series. Like even when you go to Alan, who's played by you know Seth Rogen, you know an, an alien that has like two scenes that are are very much of important scenes. Yeah, you know, it just slips in. You can and you can hear the Seth Rogen voice in it. You just Expecting Alan just to light up a you know a joint real fast. <laughs> yeah. Who was playing a crime boss? Um, the guy from Burn Notice. He was playing a crime boss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, That's okay, okay. Uh, I can't remember. I'm not gonna look it up. Yeah, but, um, <laughs> I'm too, I'm too lazy. Yeah, but the the way he pulled Mark in, <laughs> and then all of a sudden just turned on him and everything. That was some some good subverting of trope oh. well titan's mahershal ali like there's a you yeah, know yeah, I mean? yeah 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 Oscar yeah 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 oh you you can't go wrong putting him into something yeah you know what i mean like this it's just like uh, it's just like every single person is played by exactly who should be playing it right like we said seth Rogen, oh, yeah. justin roiland i mean may what like, it just goes on and on and on and on and every <laughs> single one of them are giving really good performances that add an extra dimension to what they're doing and make you want them all to be back. I mean, honestly, even the ones they killed, you mm -hmm. want them back anyway. Uh, I, I, I really enjoyed this whole, this whole like idea that Mark wants to do the right thing. And he like, his problem is that, you know, the right thing and the smart thing aren't always the same thing. Right. Or like he's underestimating himself. I, I really liked that after they showed us like what Omni man's capable of. Right. I really liked that the advice that he gave Mark was good. Yeah. I yeah. really like that. That made me really happy. Yeah. Cause he's not, yeah. he's not lying to him. He's not saying, Oh, you know, Oh, you gotta, you gotta kill everybody. You know what I mean? You gotta be totally ruthless. He's just like, this guy's using you and you're going to regret it. And that's true. Yeah. Right. The, like um, that. Mark is, Reminds me, I mean, as you were saying that, reminds me of the um, Chris Evans Captain America, mm -hmm. uh, of the guy who is just the truth. You know, he's not a Boy Scout like Superman and everything, but he is, he has a heart, he has a sense of uh, purpose and a sense of right and wrong. That That's the thing. He has a sense of right and wrong and will not compromise that just because. You know, when he gets scared or when he gets afraid and everything, he, he, um, it's the irony is that his dad instilled that, <laughs> you know, and, but it's part of, and then it goes back to that scene, Hitch, that the scene with him and his mom talking, that's his mom, you know, at the end of the day, you know, his, his dad taught him, you know, the skills and all that stuff. And it taught, you know, taught him how to be a superhero, how to be a good guy. Um, but his, his mom at the end of the day, that's him um you know with with that heart and pat and compassion um that that um that not only just cannot take away from him no matter how much he you know uses his head and you know destroys all these humans and everything and you know destroys like you know the city of chicago he can't he can't shake that and defeat that or or, or take that out of mark out of mark and that's just uh that's just great character building right there yeah. i mean just really excellent work all the way around uh, excellent voice work. The animation, uh, you know, uh, oh, and, uh, Holly, my wife recently compared the animation here to Clone Wars Season 7. She was like, this isn't oh, as good. And I'm like, well, you know, it is what it is. You know, <laughs> have different I compared to, to a Young Justice kind of animation. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
That's exactly great. Hey, I was trying to figure out what it was. I like this style. Mm-hmm. I hope they get. I hope they get even more money to really push the envelope. I want these guys to. I, I really hope that they put throw some money at this show. Jeff Bezos is throwing himself into space. You know, <laughs> I, leave, I have, some, leave, leave some money for Invincible. Yeah, right. Leave some money for Invincible. <laughs> now, my conspiracy theory is that an artificial intelligence is taking over Amazon and is going to throw Jeff Bezos into space. And what comes back from space? Who knows what comes back from space? That is my. You know, but there is no GDA in our reality. All right, so I mean, that's... Does, do, we, do we know how the ratings went for this? I mean, it I, went. I can't it, it was it was one of the, toys, the but... it, w- it was a top show when yeah. it was on, so it did very yeah. good. Yeah, so, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I mean, I, I I would hope so because I mean it is a. They renewed it for two show. more seasons, so uh, yeah. they're making Let's a two something. and a three. So they they're obviously into this. I think getting hooked up with the Evan Goldberg, Seth Rogen production company, uh, who makes this, who makes the boys is generating money for, you know, Jeff Bezos' space fortress. And that's great. And ultimately, as long as they keep making the art, I don't really care about what well, they do with the money. They're, they're not going to be lack of content. I mean, have you seen the comic books? I mean, the comic books have been going on for 15 years. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, they're, they're, I mean, the comic books, I mean, Mark has kids. You know I mean? It's... <laughs> Anyway, so this is a this is a one owned property, and that that'll be you know we're gonna go to break. Let's go to break now, and we'll come back and we'll sort of wrap things up and see you know talk about what we're gonna do next, which I know everybody's actually super stoked about to talk about what our next episode will be. So we will be right back. We're going to break. Hey Michael, do you like Star Wars? I do. Nah, nobody cares. Look, Carbonite Bounty BS is going to be a podcast you want to listen to, especially if you actually love Star Wars like Michael does. Now, Michael, what is your favorite character from Star Wars? I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Incorrect. It's uh, Jar Jar Binks. So Michael <laughs> loves Jar Jar Binks, and if you love Jar Jar Binks, then you should definitely check out Carbonite Bounty BS, which is a podcast about Star Wars. We're going to be covering all the new content. We're super excited to get to Bad Bash. We're super excited to finish our watch through of the Clone Wars. And we're super excited to get to the birth and life of Darth Vader. That's right. Come check us out. Carbonite Bounty BS this week. Favorite thing we didn't get to talk about yet about Invincible. And then we'll do thing, you know, maybe anticipated thing for next year. Okay. And then we're done. We're hey, done. this Invincible was awesome. I mean, it was one of the the most surprising animated shows I've seen in a, in a while. Yeah, you know, um, the animation was great. You know, like like um, Michael was saying, um, rem- reminded me of Young Justice. Mm-hmm. You know, as far mm-hmm. as animation style, um, the the heartbeat and, and, and compassion, or the the heartbeat of the the stories and everything was very unusual for animated Amer- American animated show. Mm-hmm. You know, and for it to be more than like a half an hour, which is what you or actually 22 minutes, 22 minutes to a half an hour, which is what you usually get with American animated shows. Um, this was either stretched out to 45 minutes to an hour, you know, and you sort of felt it in a mm-hmm. good way. Yeah. You know, like an hour long drama that you see on like a um, NBC or CBS or something like that. It felt like something that was important each episode, which um which was, you know, something that you don't really feel in like animated, you know, American shows. So it was something just great for me to actually experience and watch from from a character I had no idea about. I knew nothing about Invincible before I watched the show. <laughs> Michael, what's your favorite thing about the show we haven't gotten to talk about yet? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm on the same same um, aspect as uh, Sam on this one here. Like, <laughs> I didn't even know this show existed until you told me, guys, hey, check out this show. And I watched it all in one day. In fact, I mean, it, it was that you couldn't help yourself. Yeah, I I couldn't stop. It said play next episode. I said play next episode. Okay. Um, but well, the one thing I did appreciate with the show, besides everything that we've already talked about, each episode had its own life. So so it was good that it had the forty five to an hour long, because each show brought you know different villains, different aspects, but it kept the plot going along as well too. Yeah. So you know, as you have this whole um, Mark coming into his own Omni Man, teaching him how to be, you know, be a you know be a superhero, quote unquote. You know, <clears throat> how to own your powers. But yet, each episode had its its own story. You know, from the aliens to the Mauler twins, you know, to the to the Justice League getting attacked, to the team team. 
you know, and, and like each each thing had its own life, and its own, every episode had its own story and its own life to it. So it kept you, it kept you keep going and going. As you know, some of the some of the other shows that have like ten episodes that are you know hour long episodes, sometimes we'll throw in like a dead episode just to you know just to throw it in, where it's just like right. it doesn't do anything to advance the plot, but right. you know, we, they had to get you know their hours in. So so I was liking how. Um, you know, and being being a cartoon, it it was limitless. So it was able to be more creative in that aspect as well too. You know, from all the way to you know, having Mark go through a subway to you know to having the the, the Justice League or you know the big Justice League getting slaughtered mm-hmm. in five minutes. You know, mm-hmm. so it's um it was a very surprising and and I'm very happy that you guys introduced me to this show, so I was able to watch it. So. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm looking forward to the next season and, you know, because it just left so many, you know, plot holes that are going into the next season. So I'm looking to see them getting filled out again. I feel like, you know, we, we just run out of time because there's so many awesome things. We don't talk about robot tricking the Mahler twins and letting him clone himself and then cloning right, right. And have, yeah. having him having to kill himself. Having to, <laughs> yeah. You. This is what I wanted, like, and then the Mahler twins are just like, "This is messed up." <laughs> they just yeah, go, this is even really they weird. recognize it. It's like, this is yeah, terrible. that was crazy. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the heart of the, sh- the you know when when characters where they they the trope and um um the they should be purely evil or good or whatever. You know, you find they find some sort of way to make them more nuanced and everything yeah. to where um you know it's not just your typical trope. So I, I just love the subversion of that. It's it's like and and he takes Rex's DNA and like Rex gets all all mad about it you know get, you know uh, dirty Gambit even dirtier Gambit because dirt, Gambit's pretty dirty of a character right he's pretty sexy too sexual character but Rex Blood obviously is dirtier and that's Jason Mansukis like you have Zachary Quinto playing a robot you have you know you have uh, you have multiple Oscar winners in this cast J.K. Simmons is in this cast Sandra O's oh in this cast Julian Jacobs is playing you know. Adam Eve, who's really awesome and is insanely powerful because she can change the molecular structure of stuff, right? And then she's just like, you know what? I'm just going to do direct good for people. And then just goes off and has living her best life, happy. You know, there's so many awesome pieces of this. You know, there's a... Uh... Re- Re- Rex Flo having that threesome with the yeah, multiple woman. Yeah, with the multiple woman. <laughs> yeah. Duplicate. 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 <laughs> that, they took a lot of... That's a lot of... Woo. Activity there. <laughs> yeah, buddy, that's crazy. Mm. You know, so there's all these excellent, excellent things. You know, the one Monster Girl gets a week younger every time she uses her power, right? So she's only 12 yeah, years old li- now. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> that's that's yeah, that's just great. Like you know, subversion of the Hulk right there. Yeah. So there's all these there's all these pe- all these like little like broken toy versions of of superheroes that we know, and they're and they're vulnerable in ways that you wouldn't expect. And, and that, that gives each of them a heart, right? Because all of them are essentially, you know, chum in the water of Omni-Man's ocean. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's they all are. And so it gives a, it gives everything a perspective where at any point in time, Omni-Man could just decide that's that. Yeah. And then he As does we frequently. Oh. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, sending this show off into, into the NCFS uh, catalog, before we move on to talk about uh, the upcoming stuff, um, what is one thing that you, Michael, are interested in seeing in season two? I, I, I got to see more Battle Beast. <laughs> please, please show me more Battle Beast. <laughs> DP, how about, how about you? I'm investing in Mark's relationship with, you know, with his um, girlfriend and um, seeing how that goes. Um, also with... Um, uh, the, the, I forgot the other team, the Teen Titans, <laughs> the other girl that was in a, in a pink costume. I can't remember her Adam, name for the Adam life. Adam Eve. Me. Yeah, Adam Eve. You know, seeing how that um develops as well. So you know, he has like a bit of a triangle thing going on. So I'm a little bit invested in that, seeing where that goes. I also want to see further. Um, I want to see more Viltrumites and mm-hmm. see see how their universe, how their just how just how that works, you know, how that whole dynamic oh, works. I'm sure that'll be the main antagonist for the next step for the next season. I mean, we've already been pre-warned by uh, Seth uh, yeah. Rogen, so. <laughs> and for me, you know, 
I want to see more of the fallout of this betrayal. I want to see what what people, quote, people, like humans, like normals like us, right? Regs, to quote uh, uh, Star Wars The Clone Wars, now that I've, I'm into that show. I guess I'd say stuff like that. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're regulars, so... <laughs> You know, if you drop a building on us, you know, our arms, all that will be left. We'll be dangling. <laughs> uh, and and I think that's uh, I want to see how they deal with the fallout that they've been tricked by superheroes. That seems like a big deal. Having, you know, the biggest superhero in the world pull their mask off and go, aha, I'm an evil conqueror and yes. I'm leaving because I oh, feel yeah. like it. Yeah. See you yeah. soon. <laughs> yeah. You, uh, you, you would think the world, the world would be concerned <laughs> to yeah. say the very least now now not to so i won't pick i won't pick a current everyone knows who i'd pick if i wanted to pick today's current historical example but let's say that george bush senior was you know revealed to have been an alien conqueror to, to pick something that obviously wasn't true how how much would you trust george bush jr <laughs> mm. so I mean, for Mark too, this should have a little bit of fallout. And let's not forget, I mean, we, we skipped this because maybe it was the only sort of boring-ish episode, but it led to some other plot development. He goes to space. He meets the Martians. I, I, I There's so much that we want to talk about, but like I feel like that, that wave of brains at the end of that episode is something that is such a great image. You know, the realization, like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh just some really cool stuff. So, so we're really looking forward to season two of this show. Um, we're, we're, we'll be here for it. The same way we'll be here for, uh, for the boys and everything else. Uh, Amazon does. They can take our money. I'll shut up. This gets this this show gets five. Shut up and take my monies. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of it's a lot of these service taking our money and yeah. you know what can you do? So the Just golden age, of, the golden age of television is older of, is over. Yeah. Long live the golden age of streaming. It is not the same thing. <laughs> not the same thing. I get told Definitely that a lot not. in my regular life. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna we're gonna move on to something different. Before we do, um, I know DP has something that he wants to promote. If he wanted to, Guys, I know you got. I wrote a comic. It's called the Theme of Thieves. Basically, you could go right now. Right now, you could go to my website, themeofthieves.com. And be able to read a free preview of the comic I wrote with Dan Ikes, Alex Zipe. You know they um, um, drew the drew the story and also did the colors. And Marco Ver Verde he did like the lettering and everything. So you know we I got all the good gum go gumbo and everything on you know all up in there. Um, the story is about three people who travel through time and they're trying to um, solve the mystery of why people are disappearing in present day. So if you like shows like Quantum Leap, um, The Wire, and also Lost, three of my favorite shows of all time, this is where my inspiration and influence come from, from the book that I wrote, D.P. Brown, The Theme of Thieves. Make sure that you go to themeofthieves.com. It's all right there. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm curious to see how you follow timelines. Are you going back to the future timelines? Are you going... MCU timeline. They, 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 timeline. They, they, think about it like if you remember the show Quantum Leap, it's like oh, Sam yeah. Beckett. You know, he <laughs> jumps through, you know, he was right writing wrongs and stuff, you know, throughout history. You know, he jumped into people's bodies and stuff. I don't have my characters jumping into people's bodies, but <laughs> they they are jumping through time in different time periods and being taken out of them at certain points of time. And and the the, the, the caveat with that is that they are only limited at, for a certain amount of time. You don't know whether it's two minutes or three years or where they're going to be, whether they're going to be in a certain time period. And the, the, the characters don't know that either. So that was, that's what makes it fun. So a lot of the adventures that they go through, um, they could either go through something and then all of a sudden they're, they're popped out and then they could go through something and then, you know, they finish whatever they tried to accomplish during that period. So who knows, but it makes for a really great adventure. Theme of Thieves, check it out. All right. All right. So we are now going to transition and talk about coming attractions, which we're excited about. And the big thing that we're going to be doing next is the Disney Plus Marvel Universe series, Loki, Woo! which 
we have been ready for. Oh, yeah, <laughs> for yeah, yeah. Time. And I know you've really been looking forward to this one. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know that I'm a big Tom Hiddleston guy. Saw a turn. He was excellent in that. Obviously, he's really good as Loki. Seeing him as, I think this is the, the, the Tesseract Thief, right? Is this Loki? So, yeah, he, yeah. He, 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 um, it was from Endgame, you know, yeah. he took the test work when he went back to 2012. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, there was the Avengers movie, the first Avengers movie. And, uh, they were about to take Loki or, uh, Thor was about to take Loki back to Asgard. And, um, Loki ended up getting the test right after the Hulk was mad about, um, <laughs> coming down the Dirt. elevator. <laughs> oh, more <Dirt. laughs> <laughs> about not being able to go through on the elevator and everything and loki ended up getting the tesseract in a fit of confusion with ant-man and um tony stark and yeah. it was a whole scenario uh i'm excited i love this i love i love loki as a character like the even even like mythologically right the trickster god the one who wants to, you yeah, know, yeah. to trick yeah, everybody cool. and be sort of mischievous always always really appreciated uh loki uh and as characterized, also very excellent. And I'm glad. I'm glad that he, we're going to get a more chance to see Loki on screen after the you know, unceremonious way he was abruptly dumped off at the end of, or at the beginning of Avengers three, right? Oh uh, uh, yeah, totally yep, yep. bummed me up. So, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, what we're going to expect. So, oh, so it's uh, Owen Wilson is in this, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the cool things about about a show like this is that, you know, it's going to be funny, right? I'm looking forward to the humor for sure. Yeah, what what are you looking for the most, DP? What's your what's your number one thing that you're excited about? Just something different. So we got you know we got Wandavision. We got like the you know the magic and everything in that show and like her um you know sense of grief. Um, we got Falcon and the Winter Soldier. You know about um um the sort of you know um dived into like you know some uh, racial type stuff and everything. So we got that aspect finally in the, in the Marvel universe. Um, this show is, is just going to play with some science fiction. This is going to be our science fiction type show. You know, this some going to the, you know, it's going to be some crazy stuff that, you know, that, that, that you just deal with some times, you know, multiverse type stuff. So I'm excited about that. How about you, Michael? What's your number one thing? Yeah. I'm basically on the same page Just you know, just into something different, you know I mean? Yeah. You know, you had the serious end with, you know, the, um, you know, the, the winter soldier and then. You know the the, the the magical end, mm -hmm. um, you know with the with the Scarlet Witch, and now now let's see some more of the cosmos and the you know some of the something different, you know. So I, I'm really I'm really excited to see. It. And of course, you know Loki being a, such a great character that he is, I'm glad that he got this opportunity to get his own show. <coughs> these so. these like anti-hero villain things, right? Where, right. where a villain yeah. is is sort of trapped by circumstance into serving the common good. You know, they don't really want to, and they, they're really going to try not to, but they're stuck doing something, like, right. unselfish. You, you, you love this villain so much that you got to see more of him, and so now he gets his own show. So, And now we see if they can make the big turn, right? Can they do the Can they do the face turn? Can they Can they turn from heel to face? Uh, yeah. And uh, finally get to see a Loki without playing in the shadow of Thor. Yeah, yeah, Loki by himself. Um, you know, we get to see Tom Hiddleston just Loki it up. <laughs> you know, just just start chewing scenery and everything. You know, it's going to be great to see without you know Kim, you know Chris Hemsworth. I'm excited. I'm excited. I think a lot of this is spiritually uh, almost very similar to the, the Loki series written by uh, our guest from the Watchmen show, Daniel Kibblesmith, which was a limited run. And saw Loki sort of being thrown through time on some kind of a similar odyssey. So it reminds me a little bit of the through line to this. Um, after, you know, after the last two series we got, right? I'm, in I'm interested to see the cause. I mean, this, this, you would imagine, is the other pillar. So this ties more into the Thor slash Guardians of the Galaxy end of this. Which is always very welcome. Because it's the most fun part of, of Marvel, I think. I, I, always, I really like Thor 3, man. Thor 3 was really good. Yeah, and oh, I feel like exciting. that mix, like that fun, right? Where he's yelling, "It's my friend from work," and you know what I mean. There, like that sort of stuff. Uh, Jeff Goldblum in general in the Marvel movie was so 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 excellent. <laughs> you know, anytime we can get a Pittsburgh a Pittsburgh guy, some some uh, some reps, you know, I'm always happy about that. Uh, I like that tone. I think that that seems like the tone they're gonna go for. And after you know, Wandavision was a, was weird and interesting, and you know, 
the Winter Soldier and the Falcon and the Winter Soldier was like plot interesting and in that it kind of explained what was going to happen next, right? Like it set up something specific. This, what's interesting about this is that this Loki isn't in the same continuity yeah, as those series. Loki. Yeah, right. Different guy, different situation, and so he one, doesn't get that. He he doesn't have that redemption arc. Um, that he eventually ends up getting and everything. So this Loki is just taking us back to when he was a pure villain. So no prison, no pretending to be Odin, <laughs> no messing all of that up. None of that, um, you know, none of that stuff has actually taken place yet. So, you know, we're going to see this, like, what, it's almost like a what-if series, it seems like. And we know that anything can happen in comic books, so it's not like we're restricted to, you know, something that vanilla but one wonders what would happen if perhaps this Loki is sent to the wrong place because maybe, you know, something weird happens. Who knows? Uh, I'm always interested in seeing more of Tom Hiddleston. So if, you know, this is what we got to do to get it, I'm happy to see it as always. Okay. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm liking the fact that you can have three distinctly different shows from WandaVision to Falcon and Winter Soldier to Loki um, all happen in the same universe and pe- and we don't have to worry about how tone is going to fit in the universe. Mm-hmm. Like we literally are going to have Loki in a Loki type show with the, you know, craziness that it, what it appears to be in the same universe as Sam Wilson's Falcon, you know, now Captain America, you know, it's crazy, right? You know, yeah. that's just, right. um, but, but, but that's the Marvel universe. Show, yes. It's such a grounded show to this, you know, this aspect of everything. Yeah. And, you know, you, you're yeah. still under the same umbrella. Uh, mm-hmm. Still Very under nice. the same umbrella. You got this happening on Earth with, with Falcon and them and the uh, flag smash and all of a sudden. But something way out in the cosmos and everything, you got this <laughs> whole other thing that's happening. And it's it's all in the same universe. It's crazy. Right. And, and it just works. It just works. It works. It works. That's, yeah. that's your Marvel Universe, guys. Like, nobody... Right. Like, we're sitting here, you know, and there's a there's literally a Batman movie in the can, right? And one of the things they're going to talk about is, does it strike the right attitude? Like, does it seem like it's the right type of Batman for today? Like, is, does, does Robert Pattinson, is he... He's vengeance, right? Is that is that good for now, or is that not yeah. good for now? And he's no, vengeance. Yeah. We're not talking about that with MC. That's what he because, said. Because what we know is that this is going to fit the way it's supposed to fit. Right, it's going to be the right type of funny. It's going to be the right type of good. It is. It's going to take place in a universe that seems like it's going to tell you more about the multiverse. We know that's in the title of the next thing that it seems like Scarlet Witch is going to be really involved in. So it seems like these threads that sort of interconnect the Marvel universe are the, the needle is dipping back in. Right, this is going to tie everything together. And look, there's more than one universe. There's more than one Loki. There's more than one set of Infinity Stones. Time travel is real in the Marvel universe, and that means literally they can do anything. So lots of lots of opportunities for they just cool keep stuff. grabbing that money out of our wallets and we just keep giving <laughs> it to them and you know <laughs> And we're happy to do it. By happy the way, Disney, happy. in case you're listening to this, we're happy to keep giving you this money and we're not <laughs> in any way insinuating that we might stop. We're not. <laughs> we're over a barrel. Disney, that's where they'll keep you. All right, guys. So that's about what we got. That's what we got this week for NCFS. Good episode. Wrap up Invincible. Talk about some of the projects that mattered us. Talk about some of the things we're going to do next. It is, we're going to try to get this out soon. It's the 7th right now, evening of the 7th. And Loki's premiering the next couple days. So we're yep, going to try right. to get out this week, right? Yep. So we missed an episode just because of the other the stuff that's going on in my world. I apologize again, but you get a bonus one this week. So frankly, I don't want to hear it. Uh, <laughs> you, have, hey, you have no control over it so we're in charge of this world this universe right. guys and that's why you're getting two ups uh, anything else before we go gentlemen hey can't wait to see Loki so I'm anticipating that and looking forward to talking with you guys um, in the next few days All right, all right. And hey before you do that check out our uh, subscription button click it make sure you're subscribing to this show make sure you are subscribing to Carbonite Bounty BS Carbonite Bounty BS we talk about Star Wars over there uh, for the rest of the nerds on the Nerd Psycho Comic Flick Show, I'm SC Hitch, and we don't do anything. We just stop the show. <laughs>
Nerdcyclopedia.